Hello and welcome to this brand new series titled Research Insights Live. This first episode, we'll be talking about climate and the environment. And when it comes to that matter, we are at a true turning point in history, both in terms of the challenge and the urgency that has reached a total boiling point, but also in terms of alternatives to our current system and our current thinking. So with this new event series, we're inviting you into the world of ISS. And ISS is the Inst International Institute of Social Studies in The Hague. It's part of Erasmus University. And it's a graduate school full of students and professors and teachers and PhDs from all over the world. Um, very critical research done, very cutting edge insights that happen inside that building. I know because I studied there too around 100 years ago, but I'm still inspired a lot by what is going on at ISS. So I'm excited to share with you all at home. Um, my name is Lindsay Buda, um, and I'll be leading the conversations today. And I'm excited to first st speak about the Amazon rainforest, then we'll go into the geopolitics of the green transition that we're always talking about. Uh, then we'll look at climate vulnerability and the inequality in that. And lastly, we will look at the alternatives and new ways of thinking and new ways of bringing that thinking into practice with all our speakers here today. On the practical side, you might be watching now from the event page or from Facebook. We warmly welcome you to join in the Zoom if you want, uh, because there you can chat with other viewers about the topics, everything that you hear about. And you can ask questions to the speakers using the Q&A function. Uh, so all your burning questions are welcome. We can weave them into the conversation here. Uh, please keep them short and address to which speaker you're asking the question. Um, I want to shortly introduce who's here with me in the studio today. Here on my left, we have Lorenzo Pellegrini. I should say Dr. Lorenzo. Lorenzo Pellegrini <laughs> yeah, fine. Thanks, okay. Lina. Uh, Lorenzo, you're Associate Professor of Economics of Environment and Development at ISS, and I'm very happy to see you here again. Thank you very much, and thanks to uh, everybody who's watching this. Yeah, thank you. We also have Sylvia Berg. Sylvia, you're... Well, part of the time you're Associate Professor of Governance at ISS, but you're also Senior Researcher at the Center of Expertise in Global Governance at the Haags Hogeschool, University of Applied Sciences of The Hague. Welcome as well. Thank you for joining. Thank you, and thanks for everybody for watching. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, really nice that you're here. I know it's going to be super interesting what you have to say. Dafina! Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, hi. <laughs> Dr. Dafina Misi Jan is also here. You are Assistant Professor in Human Rights and the Environment uh, at ISS, obviously. You're also a NIAS KNAW Fellow, which is very prestigious and very awesome. Um, and I'm really happy that you're here as well to speak about your work. Thank you for having me. Yeah, <laughs> great. Okay. Sylvia and Dafina, we will speak later on. But in this first part of the program, we're going to dive right into the Amazon rainforest, the lungs of our planet. With Lorenzo, and we have some special guests to join us as well. Uh, joining online is Professor Murat Arsa. Murat, hi. Welcome. I can't hear you, you yet. Oh. And now I can, yes. You're okay, a professor cool. of political economy of su sustainable development at ISS, and your work is about the tensions between nature and capitalism and socioeconomic change, emancipatory socioeconomic change, I read. Yes, Yes. that's uh, big words, but basically we are fighting for change. Fighting for change, thank you. Then we also have Maria Morena de los Rios joining us from Ecuador. She's a program manager of All Eyes on the Amazon. That's a part at HIVUS, so that's a project we're going to be highlighting and diving into. So very happy that you Woke up for us, especially. It's early there. Muchísimas gracias. Good morning. Good morning from here, this side of the world, to everyone. It's yeah. a pleasure to, to share this morning with you. Yeah, fantastic that you're here. Thank you. I want to start. Um, OK, so we, we have this project here. It's a special project because a lot of different parties have come together, uh, led by HIVOS and Greenpeace, but with ISS and other research partners uh, there, and a lot of local community organizations. Um, taking place in Ecuador, in Brazil, in Peru. Lorenzo, can you maybe, so that we're all on the same page here, can you give a very brief description of the All Eyes on the Amazon project, what it's, what it's about? 
and maybe also your role as a, as researchers in it. Yes, it's a, as you say, the collaboration uh, among many institutions, uh, global uh, and also here from the Netherlands. Uh, most prominently, of course, uh, he was and uh, Greenpeace who are leading the project. But then we have uh, a number of partners from the field. We have both universities uh, in Ecuador, like the Universidad San Francisco de Quito. And then we have uh, indigenous federations, social movements from the countries themselves. That's a lot of different parties coming together too. to... To... To see what happens in the Amazon. So the project is called All Eyes on the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, a project with many activities to collect information and to manage and spread the information about what happens. Mm -hmm. So we have these uh, partners that are, for example, indigenous people living uh, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, just uh, since we have Maria here, mm -hmm. let's uh, keep it to the example of uh, Ecuador. Uh, they know very well what is happening in their environment. Uh, there is uh, oil being extracted, uh, there is deforestation, there is land use change. They know very well, and uh, uh, together with them, we develop systems to collect that information mm -hmm. on these impacts that they see, on these changes that they see around them, so that they can... The negative changes, the, the, negative the deforestation, changes, the... the uh, impacts from oil extraction are like oil spills, uh, oil spills, broken pipelines, oil roads that enter into the, into the forest. Yeah. And this information can be uh, then managed by the communities themselves and spread and used for campaigning purposes, for basically all the purposes they like to use them for. Right. All eyes on the Amazon. That's the name of the project. Right. And that gives also an idea. It's about looking, about what seeing what happens happening uh, in the Amazon. There, so you can use it to create change and to stop yes. the negative things from, from happening or escalating. Yeah. Before we dive more into the content, I want to ask you, Lorenzo, uh, because you've been to the Amazon so many times, you really like give your work hard <laughs> to it. Um, what what do you feel when you think about it? How do you connect to it? Well, uh, about it to that uh, mighty rainforest. Yeah, so it's uh, once uh, you stop and think back, I've been going to the Amazon for 12 years. It started really by chance with the former student of ISS that had some activities there, an NGO. And then, uh, well, I fell in love with the place, with the people, and we have these partners that we we, we have relationships with that we cultivated uh, over yeah. time. And uh, what you feel uh, when you're in the Amazon is just the overwhelming power of nature and also uh, the concern about what s some humans, some economic agents are doing to nature. Yeah, so it's a combination of place. this admiration and being like, wow, we're such a small creature in this mighty forest and, and the concern of what that small creature is, or some of us are actually. Yeah, in fact, that we yeah. we focus in areas where there are problems. So yeah. when we think, yeah. uh, you'd say Amazon, often people have this vast, pristine forest in mind. And yeah, yeah the first thing that comes to mind for me is a deforested area <laughs> or uh, an oil spill. Yeah. That's uh, what we see very often. That's These are the places where we think most of the action should be about stopping exactly. these processes that are the manifestation of... Uh, extractive industries, extractive activities yeah. in the Amazon. Maria, would you say that that is indeed the end goal? What, what is the end goal for you of this, of this program? What we are looking for is not only conservation, but also to defend the rights, the human rights, the nature rights um, of the people who is uh, inhabiting the, the, the Amazon. And it's not only indigenous people, which are our main partners in this project, but also local peoples, the Quilombolas, the Serengueiros, all the people that lives and conserves in their everyday actions, the Amazon biome. Yeah. And uh, as you were saying, the, the, the Amazon is the, we say that it's the, the land of the planet, it's not only that, it's um, um, all the relations uh, with, regarding climate change, regarding all the worldwide connections that we have and um, it's also this place where um, truly the people who live there show us the rest of the world how you can live in a really deepened 
uh, relationship with nature. With nature, yeah. That's beautifully said. Thank you for that. Murat, I want to just ask you now, like, what's from the research that you've been doing for all these years as well, what have been ma major eye-opening insights for you or for the research project? I I think the, there's so many, but I think the key one is that the need for change is not new. The injustices are not new. The, the facts are known. The injustices are longstanding. There's been a longstanding resistance against injustices. But I think the people on the ground who are the ones who are suffering the most have not been listened to. They have not been taken seriously, have not been... We have not been accountable to them, uh, and by we, I think we mean by mean uh, I think people of uh, the more affluent parts of the world uh, and the international organizations, institutions that are supposed to look out for the poor, the weak, the vulnerable. These have been going on for a long time. They're bubbling over now, but uh, very little of this is new or surprising. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good to have a look. Um, because Lorenzo, you've you've been working on a documentary about the project and to get a feel of what we are really talking about here. There's oil drilling happening in the Amazon, in the indigenous territories of the people that Murat was just describing. Let's have a look. Cuando empezó la operación petrolera en la Amazonía ecuatoriana, no teníamos conocimiento de qué podía pasar a un futuro. Es hay una colección de gas que no se soporta. Eso es un impacto territorial y después un impacto social y cultural. Al principio se resaltaba como un aporte importante para el desarrollo humano, pero después de un proceso todo todo cambió. Todo petróleo. Es un área explotada. No podemos cultivar. Es un área de desforestada. No hay contaminación. Mire, yo tengo aquí la fotografía. Es un área súper contaminada. Expose de all these problems is probably the beginning of finding a solution. Wow. Lorenzo, I, I, re I had the opportunity to watch the full documentary. I learned quite a lot of new things about it. I also learned a new word, solastalsia. Solastalsia, I'd never heard it before. What does it mean? Yes, it's uh, the feeling of uh, missing home while you are at home. Mm. And it's uh, a condition that is uh, common in places where the environment is being uh, heavily deteriorated. So the people who live around that environment or in that environment that depend on that environment for their livelihoods, but also for their mental well-being, they yeah. have a sense of loss, of longing for home while they are still at home physically. Yeah, what a heartbreaking thought. You long for home, you're in your home, but it's, it's being destroyed, yeah. It's a powerful concept that uh, is, environmental yeah. psychologists have been coming up uh, to describe something that we knew already about. Yeah, uh, and, and that I takes place in many places around the world, obviously. Yeah. Obviously, many places. Yeah. Uh, and in these places in particular, you have the contrast between uh, nature that can be so overpowering just next door mm -hmm. and then these uh, environmental impacts uh, of these industries yeah. just a few kilometers down the line. Yeah. 
another insight that I had was that these oil spills that are happening that you saw uh, in, the, in the trailer as well, they're actually not accidental. It's not like, oops, it happened again, right? Uh, yes, we can talk about uh, uh, industrial accidents, but in fact, these are accidents that can be predicted and most of them could be avoided if you did maintenance, if you did invest in, in safety, and uh, these investments are not happening because they don't improve the baseline of the companies that are making profits out right. of uh, extracting these resources. Right, so there's very minimal investment in upkeeping the pipings and everything, so it can just easily break and spill. I mean, these, yeah. are the, these kind of impacts are everywhere where there is uh, oil extraction, yeah. but in these locations in particular, of course, the companies also take shortcuts uh, and the problems are even larger because uh, they are surrounded by people that depend really on the environment for their livelihoods. Yeah. I mean, they, they depend for their water sources yeah. on, the, on the environment. They depend uh, for their farming activities yeah. also, as we saw there, those people standing uh, next to a gas flaring uh, site. They have their it's farm very, there. very, very direct So they really impact. depend yeah. uh, on that environment. Yeah. And the last thing I want to highlight that I learned was that Actually, the main product of the oil industry is not oil, it's waste. Can you say, briefly say something about that? Yes, uh, the uh, oil doesn't come out, of course, uh, refined from the, no. from the soil. What comes out is a mixture of gas, oil, and waters. And the main product, in fact, is so-called formation waters. So th these are waters that are dirty of hydrocarbons, heavy metals, in some cases also radio radioactive material. Wow, yeah. And till quite recently, uh, qu quite recently, meaning just uh, a little over 10 years ago, these formation waters in many countries in the Amazon, in many operations, were just dispersed in the environment, yeah. creating huge impacts. Yeah. And of course, the, essentially, the problem of the oil industry is not only that by combustion, by burning the fossil fuels that are extracted, you create environmental problems. That is the problem of climate change, of yeah. course, a huge issue. Yeah. But there are all the local impacts that just add exactly. up to this global I, in effect. In the documentary, it says for every barrel of oil, there's three barrels of wastewater that go into the environment. With huge variability. Yeah, so on course, the yeah. average, globally, yeah. it's uh, three barrels. But in fact... You're a good researcher to be precise about this. Yeah. <laughs> as it yeah. happens, in the Amazon, they have uh, low quality oil. Uh, and in these locations, also oil that has been extracted for a long time. So they, in fact, there is less oil per barrel of wastewater. Yeah. So the ratio is even higher. Yeah. You get more wastewater yeah. per barrel of oil. Maria... Can I, can I ask you, can I bring you into the conversation? Because you are there, you're working a lot uh, with the different communities uh, on the ground. You already mentioned a couple of communities. Um, and Lorenzo was describing like very like, real, very, you know, people depend on the Amazon for water, for farming, for food, for, you know, like livelihoods. Can you, having worked so much with these communities, can you give us an idea of like, what the, what the Amazon truly means, like the, the symbolism, the deeper meaning of, of the Amazon for the people that, are, that belong to it. Yeah, well, I'm sort of taking the voices of indigenous peoples to answer your question, <laughs> but uh, we have more than 400 uh, indigenous peoples and nationalities living just in the Amazon basin, of which more than 60 groups live in isolation from the dominant national societies and are in serious uh, danger of extinction. The, um, while the Western world uh, treats nature and undermining sources of raw materials for human use, for indigenous peoples, the forest is made up entirely of living selves and the communicative relations that they have with each other. These selves, um, from the smallest plant to the spirits who protect the whole forest, are um, as important as humans. And uh, they inhabit the trees, the waterfalls, the lagoons, the rivers, the mountains composing the Amazon forest uh, as a whole. In the Amazon economic system is an ecological web and the natural world is also a social and a spiritual world. Mm -hmm. I um, would like to encourage you to learn about the initiative of the Quichua people of Sarayaku. It's called the Kausak Sacha, the living forest. 
and they understood it uh, as a sacred territory uh, that not only provides a home for all of its inhabitants, the earthly but the spiritual ones. It also um, highlights how the emotionally, uh, psychologically, physically, and spiritually revitalizes them. The forest uh, is a complete and solid network of connections. And in this way, he cares for the indigenous peoples and the local communities who live in it. Mm, yeah, that's a beautiful way of describing it. Uh, um, and there's so much in there already. I want to ask you, um, you know, you, you have in different sites been compiling evidence of crimes, actually, you know, evidence of environmental crimes, human rights crimes. Is there a particular one that you would really like to highlight? Like we should all know about this. Yeah, maybe because um, Loreto has been speaking more about Ecuador, I would like to jump maybe to, to Brazil. In the Brazilian Amazon, in the state of Rondonia, there is an area of 150,000 hectares that correspond to the Caripuna indigenous land. This territory and its conservation are the only guarantee of survival to the Caripunas people who have faced the danger of genocide uh, since their initial contact back in the 1970s, uh, when infrastructure projects um, uh, diminish the population through conflict and contagious diseases, reducing the population to just eight people. Since then, uh, the Caripuna have faced constant pressure to their territory invaded by loggers, farmers, and land grabbers that cause highly, high levels of deforestation. It is estimated that between 1988 and 1918, more than 10,000 hectares of the forest were degraded and deforested, with more than 80% of that occurring just between 2015 and 2018. Um, we are Very uh, working- rapid destruction. Yeah, yeah. So that, that will be one case, and maybe I take time to, to, to point another one in Peru. There in the, um, in the Loreto region, um, we are talking about approximately 700,000 hectares. Indigenous communities have faced um, in discrimination for oil extraction, mainly into blocks for more than 50 years. About 23,000 people suffered damages to their health, contamination of the water and food resources as, as um, Lorenzo was mentioning that happened in Ecuador, as well as violations of their fundamental rights. And the fight against this violence is the origin of Huina de Mut, one of our um, partners in All Eyes in the Amazon. Uh, in 18, uh, 2017, Huina de Mut received the Peruvian National Human Rights Award for the, the work that they are doing in the area. But as you can see, the uh, violence against um, human rights, uh, against the lives of the human rights defenders <clears throat> it's an everyday issue. Yeah. Since the beginning of our, <coughs> excuse me, since the beginning of our program in 2018, six of our local monitors and partners have been killed in wow. the territories for protecting wow. their forest and their culture. And we really honor them every day and, and, and take this fight as uh, our own fight also. Wow. Six people have been killed for standing up for their own ecosystem. Hmm. Maybe, I mean, it almost feels wrong to just like, continue a conversation after, you know, really letting that sink in. Um, but I do want to ask you if there's any, maybe a key success that, that you've been able to achieve together with these communities. Yeah, it, we've been working together for, in this project with ISS and our 20 for other partners mm -hmm. uh, for this past, uh, since 2018. And uh, although the fight is huge, um, we have had some, some success that, um, thanks for asking for that information because it's not only the bad side, but also we, what can we accomplish by, uh, with our efforts. And um, through All Eyes in the Amazon um, and led by our partners, the University of Maryland and the World Resource Institute, we have contributed to develop a, a new deforestation alert system okay. uh, that monitors the, 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 the forest land, uh, the forest loss across the Amazon basin in a greater detail than ever before. 
we are speaking of a new 10 meter resolution, uh, GLAD S2 alert, mm -hmm. <laughs> based on the European Space Agency Sentinel to Satellite Program. And it's now available on Global Forest Watch website for free. And uh, it helps track changes in the Amazon in near real time. Okay, and wow. For example, in 2019, the GLAD um, S2 alerts detected about double the area of primary for, uh, forest loss in Peru as the previous system. And by the end of the year, this tool that uh, it's been developed through, among others, all eyes in the Amazon is going to be worldwide um, applied. And um, this means that we are helping monitor deforestation, not only in the Amazon biome, but uh, in other- Other um, similar ecosystems as well, forests as well. Yeah. Good. They are Yeah, other, good. I want to- yeah, I, I would just like to highlight it, because before I was speaking about the Car Caripuna people and how their all their rights have been affected, mm -hmm. I also want to show that why are we uh, using this technology uh, to to the moni for the monitoring and and to raise all this information in the territories? Because with that information we act. And I just wanted to sorry for the take uh, the time I'm taking, but I I wanted to. Just to tell you that in Brazil, the prosecutor's office, the, which is the federal public ministry, started investigations and implemented at least eight police uh, operations in the Caripuna indigenous territory mm -hmm. to arrest those responsible for the deforestation and the land grabbing. With the evidence collected the by the program. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, amazing. So the yeah. evidence is used not only by the police, but also by the judges. And um, we have uh, accomplished a 30% fall of the deforestation in the Cariupuna indigenous people by the action of our partners. Great. Great work. Great work. Murat, I just want to ask you, because we know um, that big oil is not really having a great time these weeks, right? Yeah. Uh, for instance, here in the Netherlands, uh, last week, a historical case was won by Friends of the Earth and partners and 17,000 co-plaintiffs. Um, they won a case against Shell. Now Shell has to slash their emissions by 45%. What they never expected to actually lose the case, so it's a really good turning point. But I wanted to ask you, like, what does this development mean uh, for the conversation that we're having now? I mean, it means obviously it's something to celebrate on its own. It's a, it's a major victory. We should not downplay that at all. It, it's taken a long fight by a lot of people, and I think their success has to be saluted. But I think uh, we should not uh, relax. Uh, this is only the beginning of the fight. Uh, there's big oil, but there's all, I mean, the big oil is not going to go away overnight. It's going to take a decade or two more before these uh, major oil companies can fall. But when they fall, the solution is not there. After big oil comes big mining. If we move to electric cars, for example, instead of uh, uh, fossil fuel-based cars, uh, ele electric cars require a lot of metals, including carbon, that need to be extracted again from places like Ecuador. And I think uh, as long as we don't change uh, two things, one, the way we consume, and two, the way we actually distribute the impacts of that consumption, the problem is only being displaced rather than uh, solved at a fundamental level. Yeah, exactly. Because as a political economy professor, um, you know, there's indeed a lot of power behind this, right? And I wonder if, if you could highlight like, some of the most important choices we have to make in this. You're already saying like our consumption needs to obviously change, but what choices do we need to make to get there? Oh, so many, but I think uh, the, the main the ones, one, the most important ones. The, main, that comes the, to the mind. main ones. The most important one is to realize that the life that we live leading in affluent countries and affluent communities. It's not just a sim. The West obviously is uh, historically guilty of uh, ecological injustice, but the middle classes of uh, developing countries are catching up in that sense with us. So mm -hmm. the first thing is to re recognize and realize that the lifestyle that we're leading is simply unsustainable and unjust. Yeah. From there, we can make many choices from changing the way we eat, the changing we, the way we consume, who we vote for, who we see, how we travel. There's so many. But the starting point has to recognize that dramatic transformation is required yeah. in the way we conduct ourselves in relation to nature 
and in relation to each other around the world. Yeah, we will continue on that topic with our next speaker, but I want to round off this conversation about Amazon with uh, questions from the audience. Thank you for, uh, for joining in the conversation. I have a question uh, from Eva, I hope I say your name correctly, uh, for Lorenzo. And uh, she's asking, are there also individuals or groups in the Amazon who actually welcome the oil companies, um, despite the pollution, despite the environmental tr transformation, uh, that maybe see it as like an opportunity for development? Uh, and uh, the answer is, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we see also in the communities that uh, have uh, are at the receiving end of si this system, where most of the impacts are, uh, you ask, uh, what are the impacts for you? Clearly, they have a, a negative uh, view of the oil industry, of the mining industry. And then if you ask, uh, how do they envision the future? They are uh, in dire straits of thinking of a future that is different. So yeah. in fact, with Murat, uh, we developed this, talking about uh, Maria's paradox, mm -hmm. where Maria is somebody we actually met, and she expressed really concerns about the impacts of the oil industry in uh, her community, in her family, and then we ask the question, what would you, would you be in favor or oppose the drilling of new oil wells mm -hmm. around your community? Mm -hmm. And she were in favor. Yeah, despite all the destruction. Despite this, but th so uh, our uh, uh, point is to question the structures Mm -hmm. They make such a she's choice. she's in favor because it, it's... The there is no alternative. There is no alternative So for she's with the shoulders against money. the wall and then chooses for right. yet more of the uh, activities that created the problems. Right. So in fact, when but we But it's think not a real choice in a way. Exactly. It's not yeah. a real choice. There are structures that constrain our choice. And yeah. what is very important is to think also about the transition in these places that have been affected so long by the oil industry yeah. or by the mining industry yeah. or by deforestation, extractive yeah. activities. We have Which to just think shows about that it's such a structural st stopping change. the activities yeah. is part of it, but then there is also creating alternatives for yeah. these people. Yeah. Another question to you, Lorenzo. Can we already watch the documentary? A question from Eva. And another question from her is where can we find more information on, on this that you're talking about? Uh, so there is a website of the project, All Eyes on the Amazon, mm -hmm. with uh, all sorts of information uh, in writing and videos, etc. Of course, we are academics. We wrote lots of articles about <laughs> this. So yes. you can look up uh, Murat Tarsell or Enzo Pellegrini on Google Scholar or yeah. wherever you like to look for. Yeah, and there's also a Research Insights website. If you go yes. to the ISS.no website, then you find a section called Research Insights that and, and there you find all the research projects that we're talking about today. And in fact, uh, there is a website also about this. Uh, there is a page about this event. So from in, there you can exactly, uh, tra yeah. uh, trace yes. us. Yeah. And uh, about the documentary, it's currently, it has been uh, shown in uh, 14 festivals, including festivals in Latin America. Mm -hmm. It has received several prizes. Nice. And there are currently negotiations with networks uh, to distribute it. Great. Uh, if they break down, we will just distribute it uh, so through the usual channels like okay. uh, YouTube, etc. But right now you can, uh, of course, watch the trailer and uh, soon it should be available one way or the other. Nice. Thank you. A last question before we go uh, to our next speaker is to Maria. And uh, Julia is asking you, Maria, uh, what legal instruments are you using or do you think are most useful for defending the rights of local communities to take decisions on their local environment? Has prior and informed consent, for instance, been a useful inst instrument in the fight? Thanks, uh, Julia, for that question. And yes, I, I, I really think that the pre prior consent is one of the most important tools. The difficulties is how uh, the different countries approach that um, international law and recognition for indigenous peoples. And the problem is that we are not finding one example of good uh, application of that uh, in the Amazon biome. Uh, also, um, we have the rights of nature. Uh, it was first uh, recognized in 2008 in the constitution of Ecuador. And it uh, recognizes the rights of the Pachamama, uh, which include the respect for its existence, the life cycles, structure functions, and evolutionary processes of nature. And since the indigenous peoples live in this 
uh, really uh, deepened relationship with nature, they also uh, get uh, benefits for applying um, the, the, the rights of nature. Uh, if you are interested in that issue, the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature are starting today uh, with a series um, of events uh, regarding the International Latin American Seminar. And there is also all the application of rights that the um, uh, Inter-American Commission of Human Rights uh, have developed in the region, especially the recognize uh, of the rights of the Sarayaku people against the state of Ecuador. So there are some, some things going on. Yeah. The Skatua agreement also. It's, uh, I will encourage you to look further for that uh, new uh, and just recognized uh, instru legal instrument in the region, which is a great example for the whole world because... Um, Can Skatua you repeat just the name of it? Escazú. Escazú, <laughs> okay, Escazú. Okay, yeah, right. the Escazú Agreement, it, um, it uh, was recognized or, uh, uh, in April, okay. two months ago, and it's the first international or regional um, um, law instrument re that recognizes the rights of the environmental and human rights defenders. Okay. Oh, wow. Important. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, all three of you, Murat Maria Lorenzo. You'll stay with us because we'll bring you back uh, the last part of the program where we'll speak about alternatives because this doesn't sit right, obviously. This is not right how it is now. So we have to uh, move away from this. And we'll talk about that with our next guest as well. Jojo Nem Singh, can I invite you? Hi, Dr. Jojo Hi. Nem Singh. Hi. Thank you, you so me? much for joining us. So just introduce this because you know, it's clear from our previous discussion, we need to move away from the fossil fuels. Uh, and with that in mind, we've been kind of looking to transition into a future based on renewable energy. Um, and I'm excited to understand together with you the bigger picture of that transition and especially what we're not seeing in it. Um, and Jojo, you are an assistant professor in international development at ISS, uh, and your research project is on green industrial policy in the age of rare metals, and is financed by the European Research Council. You'll be looking at both the demand side and the supply side of rare earth elements all over the place in China, Kazakhstan, Brazil, the EU, Japan. It's a very global outlook that you're taking. Um, and first of all, I just want to ask you, what are these rare earth elements that you're talking about? And briefly, just why are they relevant for this topic of the green energy transition? Okay, so I think I'll start by making a distinction between what we call rare earth elements or REEs and rare metals. Rare metals is a broader category of raw materials, which includes the 17 rare earth elements plus other types of elements. And we often lump them together when we think about uh, the metals that we need in order to sustain modern economic life. That includes um, you know, the rare metals that we need for wind turbines, for electric vehicle cars, but also for basic things like computers, LCD projectors. So um, as one physicist has said, rare metals are the, modern, uh, are the vitamins of the modern economy. Rare Earth Elements, REEs, which is the specific project that I'm doing, is focused on 17 chemically similar elements. So they share certain characteristics and they're often used to specific industries, namely missile and defense. They are used in electric vehicles or the renewable sector, but also in basic um, industries like um, transportation. So the project, what I'm trying to do is to figure out the global value chains, you know, basically what happens to the mineral the moment we extract them from the ground, we separate and we process them chemically and how it ends up in consuming countries and firms. Right, right, how it connects the different parts of the world in that sense. Georgia, I would really love to do a little zooming out exercise with you. Uh, because, you know, we can agree that oil needs to stay in the ground, we move to renewable energy, but you, are raising a, a serious big red flag here when looking at the geopolitics of this transition, the international power politics, let's say. 
So what is this red flag that you are seeing that most of us are not seeing? Okay, so I think I'll start by two important realities that we're facing now. The first reality is that um, even before the whole climate change, uh, the climate agreements were signed in you know, mid-2015 onwards, uh, the whole world has been uh, depending on China for rare earth elements or rare metals. Uh, basically, China is producing between 90 to 95 percent, depending on the metals that we're looking at. So, in effect, what this means is that the current renewable energy transition is being paid by China. That externalization of the cost of renewable energy is shouldered by China. Now, this has not always been the case. Back in 2002, the U.S. was the biggest producer of rare earth elements. Uh, they have a big mining site called the Mountain Pass in California. They closed that down because of environmental reasons, because it's extremely costly for the environment. What does this mean? It means that, so unlike iron and iron ore or copper, rare earth elements, when you extract them, you need to chemically separate them. You need to start, let's say it's a 5% um, pure rare earth element. You have to reach 90%. You have to keep separating and processing it. You have to keep adding chemicals. And so in that process, you increase the environmental cost of extraction. So this is very different type of extraction and production compared to, let's say, copper or iron, where you take them from the ground and then, you know, you maybe process it one or two times right. and they become up. Yeah, so it's very polluting, actually. Yeah. And what this means, um, as you explained to me, and I'm still kind of wrapping my, my head around it, um, is that we're actually quite unsure about the future of the renewable energy transition. Because, for instance, a recent report from the International Energy Agency said that, said that by 2040, we'll need at least 30 times more of like certain elements, lithium, nickel, other metals, well, this is not maybe what... Uh, uh, and it, we, we need a lot <laughs> of these metals and rare earth elements to reach the Paris Agreements at all. Um, yeah. And you told me that we basically have only three options if we were to succeed at this renewable energy transition. Can you sketch out what these three options are? Multiple choice. Okay, so before I go there, I think I want to make, uh, as a researcher, of course, we want to be more Yes, precise. do it. <laughs> the IEA report says that in order to meet the climate agreement targets, we need to increase the total demand for copper and rare earth elements by 40%, um, almost 60 to 70% for nickel and cobalt, and then almost 90% for lithium. Now, one reality we have to first, to, you know, to just really get our head around this is cobalt is mainly produced or being extracted in Congo. Lithium is produced in three countries, Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia, rare earth elements in China. If you look at the value chain, you will see that the concentration of raw materials will come from Latin America, Africa, and maybe to some countries in, in uh, um, Asia, and Asia Pacific, and, and in Central Asia. So just to understand that this is the amount of, of, of minerals that we need in order to transition. Now, in terms of the options that we have, we have three basic options here. The first option is we hope that China remains to be a reliable supplier, meaning China will continue to extract minerals and export them as a raw material. And that would allow existing suppliers, oh sorry, existing uh, companies like the wind turbine companies, the automotive sector, to get these minerals and process them and then build you know, wind turbines and solar panels and EV cars. Now that, option doesn't seem to be very plausible at the moment. In 2010, China began its imposition of what we call an export restriction policy. China does not want to export primary raw materials. They want mining, they want the mining and the, and, and the manufacturing of these high-end industrial products to take place in China. So they want the technology to slowly move to China if we want to have access to these minerals. So this is the first option. Now, if we don't accept that we want to be dependent on China, the alternative is to create a, 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 an alternative supply chain. Now, the US has began to move in this direction. Under Biden, 
He uh, implemented a national review of how much minerals there are in the world, and in particular in the US. But he also began to create dialogues, you know, the Quad, for example, which links the UK, India, Australia, and China, All, uh, sorry, and the US. All of these, um, you know, geopolitical movements is, is to basically create a supply chain where we're not going to be entirely dependent on China. If this actually happens, we'll be, maybe we're looking at 20 years time that we may have an alternative primary supply chain. Um, the third option is, which is what basically um, the European Union Green Deal is all about, for example, is to think about, is to try to address the demand side and try to figure out a way where we decrease the dependence on the supply, on the primary and supply And the demand chain. side is, is how we consume, what we use it for, use less of it. Well, there's two things there. One is, for example, the EU strategy is to recycle and create sub and substitute certain minerals in order to be we, so that we can reduce the use of these minerals. Now, this has not been very successful, and we'll we'll still have to see technologically if that's feasible in 20 years' time. One thing that that uh, like green parties have been doing, for example, is to focus on consumption. What does this mean? It means we have to think about you know how much computers that we need to produce every year. Maybe we need to think about um, how, to, uh, how, how we can um, um, change the transportation system so that it doesn't use so much of these rare earth elements. But ultimately, the question really here is what kind of um, changes in our consumption and in lifestyle can we implement both at the household level, at the micro level, and also at the institutional, at the yeah. governmental level? Yeah. So it has to go both ways in, in that sense. Yeah, exactly. All right. So just to summarize our multiple choice options, if we want a, a future based on renewable energies, we can A, hope that China becomes a more reliable uh, partner. Uh, B, think about alternative supply of these minerals that we need. So either get it from somewhere else or be better at recycling or th that's a very small percentage now. Or C, change the way we live and change the way we use these minerals, change how we consume, change how the industry works, uh, etc. Thank you for that overview, Jojo. Um, I mean, there's a couple more things that are really interesting to highlight maybe because you mentioned the European Green Deal. It says we want to be climate neutral by 2050. Um, and we need the, the, the solar panels and the wind turbines, and we need the minerals for that, but we don't want to mine them ourselves. We don't want mines in Europe, right? So we get it from somewhere else with all the destruction that happens there. Uh, that's a bit dubious, to say the least, isn't it? Yeah, so I think we can start with what happened in Greenland. Greenland just elected the Green Party, and one of the first electoral promise of this party is to halt the rare earth element project in Greenland. Now, of course, from an environmentalist point of view, this, this is amazing because, you know, we don't want more primary mining production. The irony of it, though, is we're not reducing the consumption of the minerals. We're also not reducing the projection of how much minerals we need for the renewable energy transition. So I think there's a, there's a kind of trade-off here. If the European Union, for example, decides that primary mineral production is not possible, we're not going to mine the minerals in Greenland, in Sweden, in Norway, um, then we need to get it somewhere. So, so I think this is a fundamental dilemma. Yeah. If, if we're not going to change the consumption, if we're not going to change the demand for these minerals, then we have to outsource the supply somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where, though? <laughs> well, <laughs> so I guess um, there, there's not, the, I mean, the other thing is there's not a lot of studies on rare earth elements at the moment. This is something that has happened in the past two to three years, like the realization of how much critical raw materials we need. This red flag just came up, you know, a couple of years ago, two to three years maybe. Right. The, again, as I said, the IEA report came out this year. So this is the first comprehensive study that outlines the different scenarios of how right. much um, And then the other thing, of course, is uh, I think the renewable energy sector is in a very interesting moment because it's almost the same as the transition 100 years ago between coal and, and oil. 
So you remember, you know, like we saw Ocole as, as a dirty source I don't of remember fuel. personally, but yes. We wanted to move to, to oil. And then, of course, that created that condition where oil became the motor of industrialization. We're kind of in an interesting moment as well today where we're now rallying around rare earth elements and the renewable sector as, go, as, as the answer, as the technocratic solution to the problem of climate change. So I think this is the parallelism that I can clearly see that's taking place. Yeah, so it's indeed a technocratic solution, as you say. It's kind of we're thinking about like technical solutions while we should actually be thinking about how we are organizing ourselves to start off with. Thank you, Jojo. This was extremely interesting, fascinating. And please stay on for the final parts of, uh, of our um, a gathering here. Um, because I would really like to move to these two ladies that I have here with me. <laughs> um, because I think it's important to make this connection. Um, we're, we're going to speak about climate vulnerability and the inequality in that, right? Because we have so far, we've looked at uh, what's, ha what's fueling the climate crisis and causing local um, environmental degradation. Uh, we've also looked at the kind of the international political uh, situation that we are in uh, of the tra transition that we want or think we want at this point, the way we're thinking about it now. Um, but meanwhile, we're already facing grave consequences of climate change today. Not everyone faces them equally, but they're definitely felt. Um, and I have here with me, as you know, Dr. Dafina Misijan, Dr. Sylvia Berg, uh, and I said, Dafina, you're assistant professor in human rights, uh, and Anias KNAW fellow, uh, and Sylvia, your professor, governance senior researcher at the Center of Expertise, Global Governance. Um, and I, first, actually, I just want to ask you, what, in, in, from what you've heard up to now, today, really strikes you as particularly important? Well, yeah, I go think ahead, it's, Dafina. Um, it's very interesting to see that we're in these discussions about climate change, but at the si same time, we kind of disconnect climate change from other environmental degradation. And I yeah. think that that is why we're having so many issues, because mm -hmm. we're indeed thinking, okay, what type of solutions can we find for uh, limiting CO2, uh, CO2 uh, emissions? But the solutions that we're finding are actually degrading the environment, yeah. um, but we're not counting that. So we're not taking that into consideration. So you're seeing this disconnect, um, and that is, I think, the cause of a lot of the, the issues that we're seeing now. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. How about you, Sylvia? What strikes you? Yeah, I also thought that paradox that uh, Georgia was uh, highlighting was really uh, striking. I hadn't, yeah, sort of thought about it. That I mean, that yeah, we also, if you want uh, electric cars, they need batteries, and they also need to have the resources coming from somewhere. And those are probably the more or less the same countries where already uh, mining has taken place and oil uh, has been extracted. So yeah, the, yeah. The, that's not really a way forward, is it? Uh, yeah. And and yeah, I mean, for for my yeah research. It's it's uh, it's also yeah puzzling sort of how then will we reduce uh, yeah carbon emissions will maybe reduce them slowly but even then um, other things yeah other negative effects are happening and well I'll talk to you in a minute hopefully yeah. about the heat heat waves as a as an issue that are yeah. also affecting us uh, even in Europe uh, and yeah yeah whether, exactly. and so what what does that mean uh, for in the future in this whole entire discussion yes. yeah mm -hmm. we'll definitely zoom into that. <laughs> I would like to start with you, Dafina. Could you maybe briefly describe what your research projects are about? Um, yeah, so at the moment I have two research projects. One is focusing on rights of nature, which was already previously mentioned. Um, for instance, the example in Ecuador, where you now have nature actually being given similar rights to humans. So for instance, the right to be restored or the right to evolve um, in a natural way. Um, but also having human duties connected to it. So the uh, duties of humans to protect the, the river or the mountain, for instance, um, but also having enforcement uh, type of um, rules. Um, so that is one project. And another project that I'm looking into is um, called Islanders at the Helm. And that looks at climate justice, but from the perspective of the Dutch Caribbean. Um, because, of course, uh, the Dutch Kingdom is not only the Netherlands here, or European Netherlands, but also these Caribbean islands that are dealing with climate change very 
uh, closely and very deeply. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to figure out how can we make sure that, um, yeah, the communities that are most vulnerable actually are heard um, and that we're finding solutions that in this whole kingdom situation are also applicable for them. Yeah. Let's look at the Caribbean situation for a moment uh, through the eyes of someone who lives there. We found um, a little video, kind of a selfie video, through the virtual photo exhibition Climate Change and Easter Caribbean Journey by, by OECS. I stumbled upon it and I clicked through it for a long time, uh, looking at the photography and the videos. Um, and we're listening here to a photographer. Her name is Ayola, and she lives in Dominica. Uh, and she's telling us about life there after Hurricane Maria in 2017. And she starts here in this point, at this point telling us about her hurricane lamp. I have a hurricane lamp in my kitchen. Um, it used to be hidden away somewhere because you never knew, you know, it was a once in a while thing. Wild thing. But after Maria, my hurricane lamp is, is right there so that anytime the light goes, I'm ready. So I think that's one of the things that the hurricane did. In my particular area, some of my neighbors, um, there are some abandoned homes in my community. Either the owners have died or they've migrated. But some of the homes were standing and after Maria, you know, they are no longer standing like this one right there. You know, it was destroyed in Maria. This is my grand aunt's home. Um, right here, the roof was destroyed and um, some of the debris even hit our house. Another change that we've gone through since Maria is we've lost some landmarks. For example, at the back of my grandmother's house was a huge breadfruit tree. And you could give somebody directions and you say, well, the house with the breadfruit tree behind it, you know? You can't do that anymore. So those are some of the changes that we've seen. Um, I think Maria brought out the best in some of us, the worst in some of us. I'd, I'd like to think that most people brought out their best in them, you know, helping our neighbors and stuff. And um, I still get a little nervous every time I hear a, a wind blowing with the rain. Rain by itself is not so bad, you know, but when you have that wind that talks, you know, or if you hear the river at the back of the house a little angry, you know, you, you, get, you get like... Um, like a trigger, you know, in your memory. So those are the things I'm dealing with and coping with. But you have to live life. Life goes on and we're just doing the best that we can. Hmm. So this island where Ayola, this lady, lives is not so far from the Dutch Caribbean islands. And I actually think a lot of people in the Netherlands, we get told, told sometimes, but we forget that indeed, as Daphina was saying, uh, the Caribbean islands, Bonaire, Saba, Stasia, they're actually Dutch municipalities and there's other countries in the kingdom as well. Um, Dafina, can you maybe tell us what you expect this part of the Netherlands, the kingdom, will look like in a hundred years? That's a very challenging question. Um, so climate change is affecting the six islands differently, um, but especially Bonaire is very vulnerable. Um, so they expect large parts of Bonaire actually to disappear in about 100 to 150 years. Um, and that means that some of the communities that are already living there, some of the children that are living there, might not be able to grow old on the island themselves. Um, other islands will experience more drought um, that will have an effect on the food supply. Um, so there are different ways in which the islands are, are affected by, by climate change. Um, and of course, um, islands such as Curacao, for instance, is very much um, focused also on oil production. There's now, uh, right now, the refinery is not working, but there are negotiations about what the future will look like. Mm -hmm. um, and that, of course, also has and ties to, to climate change. Um, yeah, you're saying it quite matter-of-factly, but you're saying yeah. some of those islands will not be there. Or large parts or will large not be parts there, of it, yeah. and that will affect how people will be able to live there, work there, um, be able to to do some self uh, self sufficient farming, things like that. Yeah. Um, so it will definitely ask for a lot of adaptation. Um, yeah. And a lot of finding alternatives. Yeah. Like what again? What? What's, what um, would be? 
Well, that is interesting. I think we're not necessarily looking at a lot of alternatives for the islands. Um, When we look at, for instance, the bigger negotiations that are going on around climate change. Um, So when we look at, for instance, the agreements that the Netherlands has signed, they do sign those agreements on behalf of the Caribbean islands as well, sort of. Yeah. Um, But at the same time, the Caribbean islands are being excluded from, for instance, protocols such as the Kyoto Protocol or um, other climate change agreements. Um, So that kind of puts them in the corner, uh, trying to have to... So the Netherlands is supposed to also uh, stand up for them or take care of that part of the kingdom? Yes, represent them. Yeah. Um, And that is also one of the challenges, because on the one hand, uh, European Netherlands is the biggest polluter of all those parties. Yeah. Um, And that also means that from an international perspective, the Caribbean countries are actually also seen as biggest polluters. Mm. But because they are there, um, they are also the most vulnerable. So it creates this paradox within the kingdom um, that is not sufficiently dealt with right now. Right now, it's not really on the agenda. No. No. So we have a a climate accord, a climate agreement Mm -hmm. here in the Netherlands, but it doesn't mention the Caribbean, for instance. So it's always kind of put in on the back burner yeah but for them it's a very much a lived experience and something that is very current yeah um and that should be dealt with yeah and you're looking at it from the perspective of the law mainly you're you are a lawyer Mm -hmm. um but what what was striking to me when we spoke is that you also said that the law this is a matter of inequality right Mm -hmm. but you said the law can actually stand uh, in the way of equality of real justice can you say a little bit about that Yes, so the law basically inhabits the values that we have, um, but it also creates order in a certain way. So sometimes you have these legal constructs, such as the Dutch kingdom, um, that can prevent certain um, relevant solutions to be found. Mm -hmm. So for instance, it might be more convenient for the Caribbean countries to be negotiating together with other Caribbean countries instead of together with the European Netherlands, but because of the construct of the Dutch kingdom, the legal construct of the Dutch kingdom, that is not possible. Right. Um, And the same you see, for instance, in um, issues around rights of nature, because we have such legal constructs as private ownership, um, that can interfere with how we deal with pollution, how we deal with asking for um, land back because we need it for other purposes now. Yeah. Things like that can be, um, yeah, can be obstructed by the legal constructs that we have. Yeah. I really, I'm listening to every word you're saying. You can say it so, like, explain it so well, but these are quite, um, yeah, it's quite shocking if you think about it. Yes, and that's why it always takes so long yeah. <laughs> for for solutions to really be implemented. Yeah. So even if we, for instance, find certain solutions in a technical way or a scientific way, then we still need to be able to implement it. And that is often where the law comes in yeah. and where... Um, me and my lawyer <laughs> friends start looking at, well, okay, that might not be possible or you have to look at that. Yeah. And sometimes it's overlooked as an aspect to indeed bring uh, new solutions. Yeah, yeah. All right, Sylvia, let's zoom into your uh, project for a moment because that's actually also about uh, climate inequality in the Netherlands, but then within the context of the city of The Hague. So just to, I, I'm, I'm going to briefly sketch out the project. Um, it's a research project funded by the municipality of The Hague, where ISS is. Um, and it's collaboration between Haags Hogeschool, ISS, and the Center for Frugal Innovation. Uh, a very new project on the topic of heat waves and meant for us to better understand the effect of these heat waves on the vulnerable people in the city and especially how to come to a new policy, like how, how do we then deal with it? And I wanted to ask you, you said to me, like the Netherlands has become a disaster country. What is the disaster <laughs> here? Yeah, I was really surprised myself when I, uh, I think it was my colleague uh, Thea Hillhorst who alerted me to the fact that uh, the Netherlands was in 2006 uh, really near the top of the world disaster uh, uh, index. Uh, mm. And, and you know, you think the Netherlands, what disaster yeah. is happening there? And it really is people dying from heat in the summer. And we had, uh, well, since then, of course, it actually has gotten worse. I think we all felt it ourselves. Last year was quite bad, the year before. Um, and so, yeah, especially elderly people, yeah, 
who are living alone at home. And again, this is also due to the structural changes in the welfare state where um, older people are, elderly people are longer living alone at home. There's mm -hmm. less space for them in, yeah, uh, in institutionalized sort of care uh, um, where maybe, well, there, where there is a heat protocol, where buildings yeah. are better ventilated, where there is air conditioning. Right. Uh, and if they stay longer at home and they also are more lonely, that's mm. a bigger also, I mean, the loneliness and uh, yeah, vulnerability to heat uh, stress sort of has been mapped, uh, yeah. sort of how this, how they interface and uh, because, yeah, less pe they have less people looking after them. And so what happens is that they um, might forget to, to drink. Also, your body is different when you age. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you don't actually feel that thirsty. Um, so you forget to drink and hydrate. And um, uh, yeah, and, and maybe you don't, are not able to take care of yourself because you don't really want to go out in the heat uh, mm -hmm. and buy and do the f food shopping. So yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's all coming together. So we're trying to understand that better. Who are can these? You, yeah, yeah, can you say more about, uh, because the elderly people are a clear like vulnerable group in this disaster mm -hmm. uh, are there other groups that are yeah. particularly vulnerable yeah i mean of course there are those uh, with, with chronic uh, cardiovascular and other diseases uh, and disabled people uh, um, there's also um, certain communities with yeah socioeconomic background so again it's it's the effects of heat waves are really unequal and also due to structural factors i mean of course if if you have the means uh, well to live in a in a spacious house mm -hmm. or with air conditioning uh, then of course you can cope with it much better than if you're in a cramped uh, place with uh, with maybe uh, yeah a family that ha doesn't have that much space and you're more people living together yeah um, there's yeah. the up the the, um, the homeless uh, people of course that are living on the street yeah where do they go they're not yeah. really welcome anywhere uh, inside maybe in the summer or where you know in the supermarket where it's cool or <laughs> where yeah. sometimes we as you know we might go or the public library or places that are made available to us so mm -hmm. so yeah that's those are the issues I issues think. yeah mm. and in the research you're also looking for hacks kind of how people <laughs> deal with it so frugal innovations as you call it and frugal is an you know affordable simple innovations that people come up with when they're faced with a heat wave um, can you mention a, a couple of interesting hacks <laughs> that you've come yeah, across so we far? Haven't really, I mean, we're just starting this research, yeah, you're just starting, so I can't yeah. really uh, deliver on that too much. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, different people, again, uh, deal with it differently. And, uh, and and we are curious to see what have people, what solutions have people come up with in their homes. Uh, yeah. Um, also, maybe how they compensate for um, constra yeah, constraints that they're facing. I mean, one simple thing is if you want to have a, um, a sunshade, you know, on your house, first of all, you need to be able to afford them. Uh, and second, um, there's building regulations mm -hmm. that sometimes prevent you from actually installing them. So then what do you do? Maybe you put something else in front of your window to yeah. make them. Uh, so some people, I think I've seen some pictures of flat, you know, uh, big sort of uh, houses, not flat, uh, flats, I mean, uh, apartment, apartment buildings where yeah. people uh, have um, have put, uh, yeah, sort of entire sort of, uh, uh, yeah, shades uh, and balconies have been uh, covered, you yeah. know, like that. So that gives You also mentioned a few uncivil hacks yeah, or uncivil innovations, <laughs> as you call it. Yeah, I mean, there. I was in discussions with the municipality of The Hague or, uh, you know, we were also talked about the in the Schilderswijk that, um, yeah, young people, and again, it's not clear whether it's really due to heat wave or not, but you know, they open the fire hydrants, so a lot of water comes out and they do it for days on end and there's a lot of water, yeah, wasted in that sense, but of course it also cools them, so you want to allow it, but then in a, yeah, and so, yeah, maybe that's another point I, I would like to mention is that most solutions so far have been done by public um, uh, urban planners uh, and sort of are in the public space. I mean, you know, you can put more green spaces. Yeah. But what we are really interested in, I think there is a research gap there, is what, yeah, those vulnerable people living at home, like, and again, it's also an interesting conceptual um, issue. Where does the public sphere end and the private sphere start and to what yeah. extent can can the municipality um, have influence over what people do in the private yeah. sphere um, to protect them from heat waves? Yeah, yeah. interesting questions to answer, yeah. definitely. <laughs> wow, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want to, uh, I'm looking around because I want to bring everybody into the conversation again. I think we've heard so much so far. We've heard a lot of um, 
you know, what, a lot of challenges, a lot of, of things that we need to look at and see and see that it's structurally wrong and we need to rethink and reframe how we, um, how we do things and how we organize. Um, but I want to, um, you know, I want to look at it, see if we can move forward, look into the future, look at alternatives, look at like ways to, um, to change. And maybe it's good to start at that point of extracting because we've been looking a lot, I think talking a lot about extracting and uh, of oil, of rare earth elements, etc. Lorenzo, I think that from what I gather, you strongly feel that we need to just, we need to stop extracting, especially when it comes to oil, right? And find ways to keep it in, in the ground. Um, that was also a question uh, from the audience about um, unburnable fossil fuels that, um, was it you or Murat who, who wrote about that? Uh, who we wrote uh, together. Wrote it together. Um, that, so yeah, so maybe like keeping it in the ground, what, what is that unburnable fossil fuels? Well, it's uh, the realization that there are limits. So yeah. we live in a, in a global society nested within uh, global capitalism uh, where uh, permanent growth seems uh, possible and uh, we have to realize that we have limits. One of these limits is associated with the so-called uh, carbon budget. Yeah. So the, uh, this amount of carbon dioxide that can be emitted uh, uh, and uh, without uh, uh, running the risk of uh, heating the global atmosphere yeah. of uh, more than 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius yeah. uh, with, if compared to pre-industrial times. And uh, if we take the carbon budget seriously and we look at fossil fuels, a large share of existing reserves of fossil fuels cannot be extracted. Cannot just they, stay they in the ground. They go beyond yeah. that limit. Yeah, exactly. So these are uh, so-called unburnable fossil fuels. Yeah. Fossil fuels that we know that exist. In some cases, there are property but maybe rights. In the, in the mines of big oil, they're not unburnable. Uh, no, in the mines of, uh, in the plants, in the forecasts of oil companies that will extract more and more. The projections are that uh, more and more is being extracted. And in fact, if you take all the majors, they invest uh, much more in uh, exploring and uh, increasing extraction capacity yeah. if compared to their investments uh, yeah. in the much touted investments in uh, renewable energy. Yeah. Okay, so for fossil fuels, we can say a large part of it just needs to be unburnable. You cannot touch it anymore. Um, but Jojo, since you're looking at, you know, kind of the path towards a, a green energy uh, future, uh, the way we're thinking about it now, we need to extract a lot of things from the earth again, rather than keeping it in the ground. Um, so I just wonder, what's your stance in general about keeping it in the ground or not? So, I mean, when we started that conversation, what I said was that we need to start conversing between, you know, how we're going to approach the supply question and the demand question. Why do we want to extract more of these minerals? Um, I think it's a very, I mean, my honest opinion is that it's a very delicate balance because if we don't do something about the fossil fuel uh, and the carbon emissions that we have, we're gonna end up, you know, not meeting the climate targets. But I think there are some important uh, questions around who's going to pay for this. So far, we've allowed China to pay for this. So far, China accepted the environmental costs. I don't think this is going to continue. So I guess, the que I, I guess where I'm coming from is we need to start making sure that the conversation between how the consumption and how modernity, you know, how we're going to proceed with our modern economic and political life will continue and then have a more balanced way, uh, you know, a balanced view in terms of how much minerals can we extract. Yeah. So this is sort of at the more abstract level, I think. At a more institutional level, and when I say institutional, I mean governmental and, you know, between businesses and, and the state, I think there needs to be some form of agreement in terms of um, basically how, you know, what is the pace? Because there's also about the pace of the extraction. It's not just how much we get in and what types of minerals we extract, but how quick do we want to extract them? Yeah. Because as we extract them, the environmental costs also increase. Yeah. So I want to just... 
there are multiple things that we have to do at the same time rather than one solution and focus on that. Exactly. That ties in with uh, a couple of questions from the audience to you. Um, Eva is saying, this is probably a really naive question, which is, it isn't actually, but what about alternatives that do not depend on these rare earth minerals? I understand that changes in consumption are important, but are other options possible? Um, so the, the, I've read a couple of engineering papers on this, in fact. And so one solution that they said is substitution. And there are different types of substitution. You can substitute one element to the other. You can substitute one system to the other. But all of these solutions to me, and, and my impression is there are still significant changes that we have to undertake. So you, for example, just developing a traction motor, which is used for wind turbines, that reduces the amount of rare earth elements that you need. That is still, the, the, I mean, the reduction is not significant. And, and whether it's going to work, we don't know. Because, you know, for, for engineers, if you're building a wind turbine, the different elements of the wind turbine have to communicate with each other. You know, they function together. It's a system. So if you're going to replace some of these elements, the other parts have to be replaced as well. Right. So this, the main challenge. I mean, in theory, of course, we want to replace, we want to reduce the use of rare earth elements, but what about the use of iron and copper and nickel and cobalt? These are, you know, rare earth elements is one thing, but the other elements that we're extracting is still going to be the same amount. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to make it more complicated. Another question is namely, um, what are the alternatives to these alternatives? <laughs> Um. <laughs> considering, let me put some context to it, considering all the paradoxes that you're describing behind what we now think is the alternative, you know? Now, how we're, how we're thinking about energy use, how we're extracting and not, not connecting different conversations here. What are the alternatives to our, to our alternatives that we're mentioning? So, at the, at the, it's at like the inception government. here. <laughs> Yeah. At the governmental level, there's a debate at the moment about what they call the due diligence policy. Uh -huh. So the, we kind of done this with, um, with diamonds before, where we wanted to make sure that diamonds were not used, you know, that we don't outsource it from, from conflict areas. So I think one possible solution at the moment, and I think this is a temporary solution, is we have to start thinking about some kind of fair agreement or fair arrangement in terms of who's paying for these minerals, you know, the extracting countries, and then those who are going to be using them. The other thing, I guess, is technology transfer. In many cases, raw materials are extracted from these developing countries, but then they, they just, you know, get paid at the lower cost because, at the lower price, because the more value added, the, the, the products that are more valuable, so to speak, that have more income generating effect are those that are in the industrial application at the end of the value chain, meaning the, those who produce the wind turbines, those who will produce the solar panels. So some form of redistribution and technology transfer needs to happen immediately if we want to address the equity question here. Right. As a because let me, let me try to translate that, what you're saying now, that right now we're extracting a lot from countries and we're just doing that, but and the, the yeah. value added is somewhere else. Yeah, so yeah. the countries themselves are not even benefiting from the extraction yeah. that's causing so much destruction. So if yeah. we're going to be extracting at all, they at least should be able to, you know, well, go... First, mm -hmm. Yes. I think the first step is you have to have some form of compensation. Then the second step is then you have to think about, you know, the alternative ways in which we can get around reducing the use of critical raw materials in producing renewable energy. Yeah. That's a more technological sort of technocratic fix. But I think finally, and, and I guess the most important part is that we really do need to rethink in terms of what the end goal of all of this is. Because yeah. if the is we want to have renewable energy so we can sustain existing lifestyle, that's not going to work because middle income countries will want the same lifestyle that we have in, in Western Europe, in North America, in Australia. Um, and that has to change because if that conversation doesn't take place, what we're simply doing is we'll keep transferring the extraction costs of these uh, minerals. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll keep passing it on without necessarily reducing the overall 
requirements or the overall uh, 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 minerals that we need in order to sustain it. Exactly. Clear. And on that point, Murat, I'd like you to bring you in here. Um, because indeed, like we have to change our ways, right? The end goal, what are we using all of this for? We cannot sustain, just replace it then, you know, by another source of energy and then sustain the same type of lifestyles. Uh, but how we can then change that is, is still quite a big question mark. And I know that you have written a paper on degrowth. And I just want to ask you, I mean, it's kind of a buzzword and we, you know, there's a, a book here that, that says less is more how degrowth will save the world. Um, but I just want to ask you, like, what is this really? And what would it mean if we're actually able to implement it? Um, I mean, degrowth is an important concept that I think uh, means many different things to different people. But the key message for me is the recognition that there are some limits to how much we can extract, how much we can consume, how much we can get away with uh, in the type of lifestyle that we've been building for the last uh, three, four hundred years around the world. So once we recognize that uh, that those limits are real and that they're becoming more and more urgent, then we need to make a number of changes. Of course, some of these changes can be made quickly. They're technological, they're policy based, they're, they're legal changes. But none of this, I think, uh, will fundamentally change the fundamental problem that Yoyo also just uh, touched upon. It's the issue of inequality. Inequality, as long as we can live with inequality, as long as we justify inequality, we will have a number of different problems. It might be, if it's not from fossil fuel pollution, it's going to be pollution from mining. If it's not mining, it's going to be economic inequality. It's going to be the structural violence that uh, Sylvia is, for example, describing. As long as we accept the inequality, I think the fundamental problem cannot be solved. So degrowth alone as a symbol, as a slogan, mm -hmm. will not be enough. We need to link it to a battle for creating fundamental, meaningful equality across the world. And doing that, I think, requires systemic changes, not just to our relationship to nature, but changing the, the, the fundamental economic system that we are living under, the system of capitalism. As long as we don't challenge the dominance, primacy of the logic of capitalism, which sees inequality not just as a necessary byproduct, it sees it, capitalism is built on the logic of creating uh, inequality as a way of enriching some over others. Mm -hmm. So we need to challenge the logic of inequality to be able to challenge the logic of capitalism before we can solve the climate change problem, environmental change in general, and all other social ills that come with them. Yeah. I, I would like to know, both from Dafina and from Maria, because Maria, I saw you you know, agreeing with what Murad is saying. And I wonder if you can, from a perspective of someone who is working on this as we speak, you know, as a practitioner, how do we do that? How do we make inequality unacceptable? How do we move away from that premise? I think it's a, and yes, I was agreeing when Murad was speaking because I think that maybe the people who's listening to us, it's like, oh my God, this is so big. I'm not going to be able to do anything. So why should I even try? But I really think this is a daily based decision making that we can do step by step, little by little. But it's in, in every choice that we take every day, we have the opportunity of decide the impact that we are going to have, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of so many people, nature, worldwide. So, yeah. so I think it's not that hard at the end. I think it's um, a daily step-by-step -step compromise. Can you, give, and can you give examples? We all can do it. Can you give examples of such little decisions that we make in which we can choose for equality? Taking the bike or a car in the Netherlands. Yeah. As easy as that. Mm -hmm. Deciding if uh, where I am going to buy my food, deciding yeah. uh, who I am going to, at what store I'm going to go, where am I going to travel? Yeah, everything at the end has an impact in the Amazon biome, or in China, or in everywhere else. Yeah, because we are so 
extremely we interconnected. All connected. Yeah, we're all connected. We are all connected. In many ways, actually. And Dafina, it's also a question from the audience where, you know, what do you think is the role of the courts here? In, in enforcing inequality, in protecting the Amazon. This person has, for instance, been following the Chevron case in Ecuador and how, mm -hmm. you know, corporate interests have an influence on the law. What do you think is the, the role of the law and the courts in this? Well, I do think that we're in a time where the judges are actually feeling that they need to push back a little bit more. Normally, judges don't really, they aren't necessarily activists. They really stay within the bounds that the law gives them. Mm -hmm. But because we're seeing so many changes that cannot be reversed, you now see that judges are pushing the boundaries a bit more, that they're indeed saying, okay, if the state is not stepping in, then we as the judges need to step in. And that's why we have cases such as uh, Shell uh, or Muyo Defensi against Shell, mm -hmm. um, the Exxon case, also the Urgenda case that we had yeah, a couple of years. Yeah, that's actually a question coming in now. It, if you have any examples of successful legal mobilization campaigns, and you're mentioning them yeah, as exactly. we speak. Yeah, exactly. So you have uh, different cases against states. So the Urgenda case was a case against the Dutch state. Then we have cases against companies. Uh, the Shell case yeah. is uh, an example of that. And then we have new developments such as rights of nature. Um, so in New Zealand, we also have um, the Whanganui River being given legal personhood, just like the example from Ecuador. Also in Colombia, we have mm. judges pushing the boundaries when it comes to rights of nature. So those are all kind of responses to kind of the failure of environmental law that we had before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that are kind of the loopholes that judges and um, different organizations are trying to find to yeah. make sure that we can protect both the environment and uh, communities as well. Yeah. But as you said, human rights and maybe also rights of nature mm -hmm. could still exist in a system of inequality mm -hmm. or a system that's not necessarily just. Could you try to explain that? Yes. So what we're seeing now, I think we need to understand that law is a tool. It is also a tool to create order. Um, it's sometimes, or in, in a lot of examples, it's uh, a way to preserve the status quo, but you can also use it as a way for change. Yeah. Um, and it's preserving the status quo because it's produced by those... In power. in power. Yes, so uh, that can be political power, economic power, um, and then indeed you have legal mobilization, which is often done by communities that are more vulnerable, communities that are then supported by different organizations trying to push for change. Yeah. Um, so indeed, we still need to remember that sometimes there is a change, but it still um, exists in the bigger system. Yeah. Um, and that means that you have to really pay attention um, and make sure that there's no infringements. Yeah. Um, so a win by itself is not necessarily always the end result. You need to continue to uh, campaign, to support, to really push the boundaries. Yeah, and it um, also really depends on who is pushing then, right? And who is, is yes. heard in that. Um, exactly. Because Murad, this also came up in our conversation, the effect is effectiveness of rights of nature, because we've heard that it can actually really make a difference in these cases. And I wonder what you uh, would like to add to that. Like, What needs to be in place for a concept like the rights of nature to work? I think, uh, I mean, the, the legal structures, the constitutional structures are, of course, very important. But if we look at uh, the places that we've been working in uh, in South America, but also around the world, there are many communities uh, that suffer even there are existing legal protections. The case that we, we looked in, in in Peru with our colleague Mar Martuerta Martinez, indigenous people were fighting to have laws that were put in place implemented for 20 years and they were never listened to. So I think, and the reason why they were not listened to is precisely because the, the system in which they're living in does not see indigenous people as worthy of those rights. So you can write as much as you want in the law books, but if you don't actually see people of deserving the protections that they're, they're entitled to, there's not much that you can do to achieve the goals. And yeah. In those cases, indigenous people actually rose up and uh, fought, literally fought, to yeah. get what they were, they were, they, you know, they they were owed. So in that sense, uh, it's not just the law, 
but making sure that people are empowered and recognized as equal, as dignified participants in human life. And what is needed for that? What is needed to achieve that? For that, I think, again, we go back to the, the idea of equality. We need to dismantle the system that sees certain people as less worthy because yeah. they're poor, because they're indigenous, because they're racialized, because of their sex, their gender. We need to eliminate all these different barriers to achieving full dignity in human life. Yeah. So we, when I talk about equality, of course, it, it has a fundamental economic dimension, but it's more than that. Equality means everyone is entitled to the same protection as a human being for, for just for being a human being. And yeah. that I think is missing, not just in the human it's, being, it's, it's so, being a beyond living also, being. There's also more than, uh, more than human life, but yeah. this is missing globally and it's a systemic issue. It's not, we should not sort of like say, oh, it's a problem out there in Peru and Ecuador. It's also in the Netherlands. It's also in the United States. It's, it's also in China. Yeah. And I think uh, that struggle has to be global connecting all the marginalized people, whichever way they're being marginalized. Yeah. So it's really a choice and it's really about our values that we choose to live, actually, that we choose for every day, every day, every day of equality. Um, big words, huh? We're coming slowly towards the end of our conversation here. Um, but I do want to kind of hear if there's, you know, like we were kind of already touching upon that, of, of what this means for, for everybody watching, for, for me, for all of us, you know, like how in the decisions that we make and what we accept or do not accept in the knowledge that we, uh, that we you know, um, absorb and the, the questions that we know are going to be important in the next decades, uh, in the evidence that we gather, in the, the movements that we support, etc. Uh, but I want to ask you, maybe starting with Sylvia, because you've been doing a lot of work which is with people involving people in citizen science, frugal innovation, uh, decentralized policy development. How, um, yeah, what's the role of, of all of us yeah. in this? Thank you. Uh, shift? Yeah, I had another idea. Maybe just uh, just briefly want to mention. I was yeah. thinking what Murad said about capitalism and how it's also interesting to look at how the capitalist system is changing from within to some extent. And it would be nice to have a discussion of whether that's a, sort of a facade or whether that's really happening. But mm. you know, for example, there's self-regulation. There's the extractive industries has has self-regulating to some extent in in, in DRC. Well, or I'm sure elsewhere. Murad has a good one liner exactly. about this. <laughs> but also, uh, is but it, also, I want to really yeah, ask okay. him: Is it? <laughs> Is it a facade, this capitalism changing from within, or not? More Can or less, yes. Yes, okay. uh, I think, uh, I think uh, there are meaningful changes. Uh, minimum wage, uh, eight-hour working days, these are fundamental gains that were secured, but the fundamental inequality doesn't go away. Things mm -hmm. just get polished a little bit, mm -hmm. but the uh, inequality stays. Jojo, I see you smile. What, what would be your answer to this? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I mean, I come from Asia where we have a very strong sense of uh, 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 um, sort of just looking into what happened in the past 50, 60 years. There are, there's an interesting book that I was reading and it's called The Rise of Eco-Developmental States. And basically about the in passed through the stages of sort of the, you know, the, the, because they had this period of industrialization, extremely polluting, and now they're at a turning point where environmental policies are being embraced. And so to me, I'm, I'm probably a lot more optimistic that if you support certain policies that are, you think are promoting more equality, that are able to cater to sectors that have lost in, you know, that, that were the losing sectors, for example, or that uh, you propose um, policies that promote more, um, more, more government policy to regulate so that people could, you know, those who are culpable can pay more. These are small steps, institutional steps, you know, policy steps maybe, uh, but you kind of improve them by little. So I, mean, the, the, I, I tend to see this as, as sort of a gradual process of, of reform. Um, I, not to disagree that the system is unfair and unequal. I think they are. Um, but I think for people who want to think about what they can do and what they should be doing, so we should think about these 
choices that are facing us now and make those choices, make those choices as Maria was talking about a while ago. Lorenzo, is it gradual change or is it systems overhaul? I think uh, what I have in mind is uh, a question that looms large, and that's the question of the politics of this. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about, uh, I mean, we can look at us uh, here, what can we do, what can we do as consumers, for example, what can we do through the courts, and I think uh, what can we do as citizens? Yeah. How can we mobilize? How can we get together? How can we fight for the change that is uh, yeah. necessary. I mean, even a simple question like, uh, uh, am I going by with the bicycle or am I going by car? We are here in Amsterdam. If mm -hmm. you look at those videos from the 70s, it's incredible how Amsterdam was full of cars. Mm. Now we can choose effectively of going by car or going by bicycle because people since the 70s have been struggling. Yeah, They've been fighting for the right of space, for the right of uh, cycling safely. And that's, uh, I think, really the question that looms large. What yeah. do we do as citizens? How do we mobilize? How do we break the structural violence that is uh, uh, embedded in these inequality structures that uh, Murat also was mentioning? Yeah. So if you yeah, want to no, I just wanted to uh, in a few sentences. Yeah, or? just very briefly. I mean, I, I think in the heat waves, uh, it's also about local heat plants which are being developed at municipal levels. And there, for example, yeah, it's a political decision whether you involve people or not, right? Whether you invite them and you really co-create, or whether you invite them because you know you have some element of participation and that will look nice, but you don't really take it seriously. Yeah. So I think there, local people can mobilize and say, look, this solution. Would have we come up? We have come up with why, why don't we institutionalize it? Why don't we scale it up, or make it a policy, or sim simply having a seat at the table? I think that's that's where yeah, at these where decisions are really being made and uh, yeah, policies are made. Yeah, yeah. Delfina, you mm -hmm. want to say something final about this? What um, do we do? Yes, so I think that we have to start thinking about. Of course, we have human rights. We have this minimum. Um, but I think the discussion will be more and more about what is above the right. So what are the privileges that we actually um, need to hand in in order for more equality? Mm. Uh, so indeed, if, you, if there is water scarcity and your municipality tells you not to water your plants and you say, well, I, I have the money to pay for it, so why shouldn't I just do it? Um, those are the type of things that we need to think about. And I think that that is very hard for people to do. Also, that we're now seeing that um, when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic, what do we consider to be our privileges? How can we divide those privileges? Um, and how can we th rethink that? Um, yeah. I think that that is going to be a big question that um, we cannot answer in one afternoon. But yeah, um, yeah I think we're pushed to, to think about those things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Very consciously, making conscious decisions, really checking yourself and your values and what you stand for and what you want to fight for, indeed. Well, people, we've come to the end of this first uh, episode of Research Insights Live. Um, we've, we've discussed a lot and um, thank you for that, for sharing all your insights and your eye-openers, very helpful. Uh, indeed, this is the beginning of a discussion. All these, all these topics are immense and extremely interesting. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date on these insights and read more about everything that you've heard about today, the project covered, we mentioned it before, there is on the ISS website a section on research insights where there's all kinds of ways to share um, findings, bite-sized ways, very understandable and digestible and uh, definitely worth uh, reading. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your time. And see you on the next episode of Research Insights Live.